Hi, I'm Steve. Welcome to my shop. Today we're going to continue the episodes on sliding table saw purchase considerations. Today we're going to cover the topics of controls and guards. So let's get to it. If you are looking at a sliding table saw with one of the longer sliders, typically what you'll see is a control panel here if you have mechanical controls for the, the raise and lower the blade and the blade tilt. Uh, that control panel typically consists of on-off push buttons for the main blade, the scoring blade if you've got it, and an emergency stop push button. If you're looking at a saw with mechanical controls, sometimes you will see both the blade tilt and the blade raise and lower on this side. Uh, usually you'll see the, the blade tilt here. And one of the options that's useful, and they're fairly inexpensive, is the, uh, the clock hand wheel if you don't have digital, uh, digital readouts. And they're very accurate. They're, they're, they're quite nice. I don't find the, the clock hand wheel so useful on the, on the blade height. Uh, typically, you, you're just setting it to where you, where you want it anyway. For blade height, that's usually on the front of the machine, but sometimes I think there's some machines that probably have that on the side too. That's the mechanical controls. The next step up is uh, digital controls where they have a, a power motor to raise and lower the blade or, or tilt. And often those power, power controls are, um, uh, asso have an associated digital indicator. Those are nice. I don't find the controls down here being useful because it's basically just above knee height for me. Uh, it's, again, that's just something you'll have to take into consideration for your own uh, purposes. One of the things I'd like to cover here, just briefly, and I want to envision, <clears throat> want you to envision putting your sliding table saw up to load sheet goods. And by sheet goods, you're going to typically have the, the table all the way to the forward position. You'll load sheet goods on your slider. Controls down here aren't near as convenient as controls, either overhead controls or something else I'm getting ready to talk about. Because you, you've, got, you've got the plywood covering your controls. So when, I've got, when I had a machine like that, I would typically turn the machine on lock the table, then load the sheet goods, and then, then make my cuts. One nice option that, that some machines offer is a remote start and stop push button on the front end of the, the sliding table, uh, both for the main blade and scoring blade. And uh, that, that's a really nice option. This machine does not have that. And not all machines that's available on, but. In those events, you can load your sheet goods on your sliding table and then um, start, the, start the machine. And the third option is an overhead controls. And typically, you'll see this on the, the machines that have computer controls of some sort with a display screen. Uh, in this particular one, you've got the display. There's an emergency stop push button, the start and stop of the main blade, start and stop of the scoring blade. This is uh, uh, for uh, when you enter things on the touch screen to put the, uh, put, the put the blade height and tilt in the appropriate position. And this is a manual mode, hand mode. I'll just do a real uh, quick overview of some of the tools that are available. There, there's, there's nice tools available. I just don't find the, the digital tools as quite as useful on the sliding table saw as I do on the shaper. Okay, this is the uh, main screen. I, I would imagine that most saws with the digital uh, computer controls would have something similar to this. Screen sizes can vary, uh, but basically we've got this particular saw has an indication of blade height blade tilt, and fence position. And the fence position on this saw uh, has both a high 
and a low position uh, to enter the parameters that you want to set. Uh, let's say I want a blade height of 50 millimeters. And maybe a tilt of 5 degrees or 15 degrees. And I just push that button. And the blade is tilting and going to the appropriate uh, position. I'm going to go back to the original. Some of the other indicators on this display are the material thickness. I don't use that a whole lot. It, it comes in useful for, for some of the miter and beveling uh, aspects, uh, which you may have seen on one of, my, one of my other videos on the compound miter. And this allows you to convert. If you want to use imperial measurements, you just press that button or you go back to metric, which is what I usually use. Uh, moving across the screen. And these are some tools that are used. There's a rabbiting uh, tool, a dado, a uh, bevel tool, a tenoning, and then the um, uh, repetitive uh, cut uh, feature. And actually, I, I don't use a lot of these tools. I use the dado and the repetitive cut mostly. But just to go through them, Okay, this is the dado cut. You put in your parameters that you want and it allows you to go scroll through and it tells, you know, it'll tell you where to put the fence for your first cut. And when you go to the next one, this is what I don't like about it. I don't like putting vertical pieces against a short fence. But that's just me. You may have different feelings. I don't find I don't use this particular tool for rabbiting. There's I use the shaper for rabbiting. The dado function, I do use the dado function. Uh, I think I did another video on that, so I don't really uh, see the need to go through that. The uh, bevel function. And the bevel function uh, just allows you to put in various parameters, and it'll do the length calculations for you based on the thickness of your material. I don't use this one. Go back to this one. Again, just like the the rabbiting, uh, I don't use the I don't use the saw for tenoning. I use the shaper for that. A repetitive cut. I actually use this uh, quite a bit more than what I thought I would use, uh, primarily because uh, when I make jewelry boxes and make dividers in those jewelry boxes, I use this feature. It's just handy to handy to use. It's it's a nicety, but I don't see that any of these are really all that must-have type things. Uh, this is some other tools here. This tool here, I don't use this. It's for it's similar to the the bevel cut before, but uh, you know if you're if you're on the fly and you want. You want to know what fence setting to use if I want to put in a, a 15 degree angle. And then uh, what it's doing, it's, it's telling you what your stop settings need to be for that angle, taking into account the thickness of the material. This tool is for the uh, miter comp length compensation. I don't need to cover that here. There's uh, uh, another video on the sliding table saw techniques, so we'll cover that. Uh, that's covered in another video. Uh, there's a calculator function. I don't use that. I don't even know what that is. And this setting here is for adjustment of the height and the position left to right of the scoring blade. Another thing, the uh, the uh, computer control uh, machines offer you is a, um, a tool storage. So I've got a number of saw blades that I 
that I keep stored. These are my most commonly used enter ones. The, enter those parameters. Let's see if I choose one. These are the parameters, the diameter, the kerf, the blade plate thickness, and the maximum speed. And if, you, if your maximum speed, if your actual speed of the setting is higher than your maximum speed that your blade allow, the saw won't start. It's just a safety feature there. And this is a service, uh, the service menu. Uh, this is messages. This is for various calibrations, and that's get, to get into the service menu and uh, where all the machine parameters are stored. Uh, the only one I really use here is this one. This allows you to calibrate the zero of your blade height, your blade angle, which I've, I've never had to set those. It, it self-calibrates. Uh, this um, is another uh, method for uh, storing your, um, or calibrating your scoring blade. And the one I use most frequently is the fence calibration position. Now on this saw, if I move the fence with the saw power down, it will lose its setting and I'll have to recalibrate it. Sometimes that happens. So that's a brief overview of controls, digital controls in particular is what this saw has. Uh, is it necessary? No, it's not. And it does have a downside to it. Uh, they, they could put your machine down if they fail. And about five years ago, I had a failure of my uh, touch screen. The touch screen just would not accept in, uh, input. The computer display worked fine, but it didn't do any good if you couldn't put parameters in to tilt the blade or to, to raise and lower the blade. And it took about five weeks for me to get a replacement computer. And I did install it myself. It's not hard to do, but uh, you know there, there is a downside and there is a cost to that when they do fail. So, so just be aware of that. Now let's move on to the overhead guard system for uh, sliding table saws. So there's two types of overhead guards. Uh, I've had both. Uh, my first sliding table saw had um, basically a plastic hood that clipped on the riving knife. It had a small dust collection port. Uh, it didn't collect dust nearly as well as this one. It's just a matter of physical space. You, for just a clip-on hood, you don't want a whole lot of weight hanging on it. and. Uh, because of the smaller hose size, you won't get as, as good a dust collection. And the um, another downside is you can't use the overhead guard when you're making a non-through cut. Now this particular guard system is the is the uh, overhead guard. It's mounted to the right rear side of the machine. It's adjustable independent of the blade. I can get well, it looks like probably about f six inches or so. It's adjustable, you can lock it. <clears throat> it has a very large dust collection port. It's, uh, this is 100 millimeters or four inches. Uh, I've had small cutoffs actually go up and down the, uh, down the dust collection uh, uh, hood from that. It's, it's much better from a dust collection standpoint. It gives you the ability to use a guard when you're making a non-through cut. Uh, it's rare that you'll ever see me use this uh, saw without the overhead guard in place. It's just an enhanced safety thing for me. And they can be swung out of the way. This has a little kip lever back here. Some people, they just leave them loose all the time. You don't necessarily need to have it there, but uh, <clears throat> you can swing the guard completely out of the way. And I've got clamps that interfere with, with it, so it's, so in order to get it out of the way, I've got to either remove the clamp or push the table all the way around. But it, you can get uh, a lot of access to your blade uh, for different cuts if, if you have need to. So that's covered the uh, controls and the overhead guard systems. Uh, just choose what best fits your needs and budget. Uh, 
This kind of wraps up the section of the sliding table saw purchase considerations for things that you have to purchase with the machine. The next portion of this series on sliding table saw purchase consideration are accessories that you can add on after you've bought the machine. And uh, they're not tied to a particular configuration. And they can vary from machine to machine. Some are third party, some are manufacturer, and some are, uh, are just you know, shop made. So I found some of them to be very, very useful and effective. Others, I probably should have spent my money elsewhere on them. So we'll cover some of that. So anyway, I thank you for watching and have a great day.